recording and change the V show my screen. All right. So this is a case sent to me from the guys in Augusta. It's a nice case. This is a patient with HIV who had a anterior chest wall mass. I love the radiograph. You can see it's kind of this um, large soft tissue mass on the lateral. You know, it looks like breast tissue in here, but it looks like there's not an there's not a, a separation between the two. And here's the CT scan, and you can see there's all this infiltration of the fat along the anterior chest wall. And I've never seen this before, but I've heard about it. And there is some uh, glandular tissue here, but all this infiltration here. And this was biopsied, and this is a HIV lipodystrophy. And maybe you guys uh, uh, on the coast have seen this more, but I don't know. David, have you ever seen it before? No, I have not. And I don't, I don't understand it, what causes it. Howard, do you ever, I mean, uh, Travis, do you ever see this in San Francisco, no. Emory? Not yet. It looks like uh, it looks more like silicone injection. Yeah, it's some kind of dystrophy, but this was all lipodystrophy. On um, they actually biopsied both sides. It's a cool case they sent me from Augusta, Georgia. So I, I thought I'd share that one. They sent me a couple other ones. I'll share another week. Is is it related to uh, heart therapy? I don't. I know some know. older heart drugs were causes of lipodystrophy. Maybe so. I I don't know. I, I'm not familiar with it at all. So this is wow. a this was a cool case I came across incidentally just doing protocols one day. I'm going to show it backwards, but this patient complained of a mass, and if you look at the radiograph, you see there's this big mass here in the right chest wall that you don't have on the other side. One of the other places to look, and then on the CT, which hopefully is showing now, yeah. And I've never seen one of these before, but there's this mass in here, and you can see it's very low attenuation. It's denser than regular fat, but much less uh, lower attenuation than muscle. And it just seems to be hiding out in here. It's got all these vessels passing through it, kind of splaying them out of the way. And so this was actually biopsied with a core and the pathologist came out right out and called it a hibernoma. Mm -hmm. So that's a brown fat tumor, it's benign. It's a, don't do anything with it. But I've never seen one, I sure haven't seen one this big. Uh, what sort of attenuation does it have, Jeff? It's, it's, uh, it should be a little denser than, than ordinary fat, right? Yeah, see, here's ordinary fat. Here, I'll, you know, I'll do, I'll make it a little less noisy for you guys. You can see here's the sub Q fat, here's some skeletal muscle. So it's somewhere in between. I can put a, um, a region of interest on it here. It's uh, mean is negative 38, and the chest wall mean is negative 112. So. Kind of cool. Hibernoma. Hibernoma, brown fat tumor. Why not? You know, I think I've heard the term somewhere, but I can't remember in what context, but no. I, 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 never look it up. That. I figured that's what it was when I heard it, but then I, I had to look it up to see. So, yeah, it's Brent, just a big mass. Brent showed one not quite that large. I, I see him on there, or I thought I saw him on there. Brent, didn't you show a hibernoma at some point? Uh, we don't have his audio. All right, well, here's a case. This is a patient with asthma who presents with worsening cough and has some other systemic symptoms. And you can see there's a, a patchy consolidation in the right upper lobe and a little bit of far more nodular or, or linear stuff elsewhere in the lungs, but clearly an abnormal radiograph. So you might think of an asthmatic, an, an, an eosinophilic pneumonia or a drug reaction. We have an organized pneumonia or just even a run-of-the-mill infection. And this is the CT scan, which shows that pattern of consolidation ground glass we typically see with organizing and or eosinophilic pneumonia. But then we've got a lot of thickening in, uh, of the airway walls, some sort of nodules around it, uh, more confluent areas, and what look like uh, tree and bud, bronchiectasis, bronchial wall thickening mm. in these larger confluent areas. So with the systemic symptoms, this patient actually had skin involvement, uh, had uh, elevated IgE, he had some eosinophilia. This was a eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, formerly known as church strauss And to me, these areas probably are areas of eosinophilic pneumonia in its purest form, plus the, the all the airway involvement. And uh, here's the radiograph. So this is the radiograph from a month before. You can see it had started over the course of a month. Let's see if I can bring them up together. Yeah, so this is the most recent radiograph and you can see it sort of started more nodular looking OP-like and kind of blossomed over the course of about uh, five weeks. 
So don't see it very often, but the cases I have seen, um, you know, Nestor did a paper many years ago where they described some septal thickening, which we don't really have much of here. This is more, <laughs> but they described areas of ground glass opacity and consolidation, which to me is just an eosinophilic pneumonia. All right, um, this is a cool case. So this is a young guy, and let me show the screen here, uh, who I think had a vague symptoms, a cough or something, had a radiograph that showed this sort of infrahylar or hyalur lymphadenopathy. I'll show the lateral. Here we go, got this round mass. So a CT scan was done at that time, and it just confirms the presence of um, lymphadenopathy in this sort of lower, sort of a bronchial or low, interlobar distribution. So around here, we see this quite a bit with histoplasmosis, but the problem was is he didn't have anything in his lung. He had some septal lines here, so I presume there was some venous compression. Someone got an idea to do a PET scan. I'm not sure why. It doesn't really help, but what it shows is um, FDG activity in the hyalur region and then milder in the activity in the subcarinal region. They did a bronchoscopy and did a biopsy, and this all came back as a uh, plasma cell variant of Castleman disease, uh, human herpes virus 8 negative, which I tend to think more of as not lymphadenopathy, but as patchy lung disease. But uh, this was in the nodal disease, and it's, um, I don't really understand it, um, why he has it, but they, tr they were going to try to resect it, but they, they couldn't, it was in multiple stations, so they opted not to. So they did a follow-up scan and it was exactly the same. So I don't know what they're planning on doing with it, but I have very little experience with the plasma cell variant of Castleman disease, other than this is specifically HHV8 negative. What, what was HIV tested for? It was negative. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because that's where my experience has been with HIV, where they often get more lung involvement. So. Yeah, now this is something I have never seen before. Um, this was a patient, maybe I want to see if any of you have seen one of these. Um, let's see. This was following a, a thoracic surgery case, and there is this, looks like a graduated cylinder almost here. Um, so has anybody ever seen one of these before? Don't recognize it at all. Is this, is this something that was accidentally left in? Yeah. It's a, it's a thoracotomy port? Yeah, it's a VATS port. The VATS port. Huh? Interesting. The, the, we've had one. Interesting. The, uh, the fellow was saying they fall in not infrequently, but they, they go get them out. But this one must have fallen in unbeknownst to anybody. Uh, and uh, yeah, they just went and they fished it out with a scope. But um, yeah, this was an esophagectomy. That's right. You can see the, the mesocytal drain here. But that's a VATS port. I've never actually seen one before. So considering how frequently they use them, but that's what it kind of looks like as a graduate cylinder. It, it looks like it's got some, some uh, wiring or wrapping around it to probably keep it from sliding so much. So and you think it's in the pleural space or just extra pleural or hard to tell maybe? Let's go back and look. That's a good question. Just curious. And I, that's, I think it's in the pleural space because they were in on the right and here are the ribs out here. Because I think um, the extra pleural space would be too small for something that big, and it, it, it's why it felt in there um, pretty, pretty easily. Now, in a general sense, um, I don't usually associate esophageal resectional surgery with VATS. Oh, we do most of ours with VATS here now. Ah. One of our, uh, our junior thoracic surgeon, that's kind of his area of interest, is less invasive esophagectomies. So he, so he will do a... Um, sort of an thoracotomy Iva Lewis equivalent thing, but via, via VATS. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty really? impressive. Yeah, it's, that's, that's impressive. Okay, this, I'm gonna show two cases now that I happen to come across twice in the same week. The first one's just run of the mill. The second one is an interesting complication. So this is a case of respiratory papillomatosis. And I've got some pretty pictures to show. So you can see, and this is an outside CT, so I don't have, I unfortunately don't have reformats or thins or virtual bronch, but you can see all these little papillomas clustered in the proximal airway. There was really not much out, out there, um, you know, old histoplasmosis. And luckily, th these are the, um, let's see if I can get this to play. Uh, let's see if it's going to play. No, it doesn't want to play for me. There we go. This is cool because you can see how they move when the patient breathes. You can see there's quite a bit of obstruction, but these are very typical 
of the squamous papillomas here. So they went in and uh, debrided them at the time. So that's just a nice example of this. Interesting with this case, how they were all kind of clustered in one area down there. And I'm sure over time there can be more. But the reason I'm, I came across it is because I was actually looking at this case. So this is, um, I'm going to, let me pull up the right images, get these in order. So I'm going to show you some older images first. Uh, let's do this and then share this. So this is another case of papillomatosis. And you can see this patient, if you look, oh, these are the wrong series. Hold on, let me grab some fins. So this is back in 2005. And you can see there's a, a, a bunch of little papillomas all in the trachea. And he already has lung involvement. He's got these irregular cystic lesions. Sometimes they're more nodular. He's got a, a larger thing. This thing ended up being something bad. So that ended up being a squamous cell cancer. Uh, at, this is 2005 outside place. Later on, uh, where's the 2009? Here's a radiograph from 2010. You can see that mass got bigger and uh, was sent here for workup. And this was biopsied and is was a big squain which these can turn into. So he ended up having a pneumonectomy for his squamous cell cancer. And as far as that was going, he was fine, but of course he's got this papillomatosis. So here's a CT, let's see, I think this is a pre-surgical CT. Yeah, so here's the CT before his resection. You can see there's this big mass now. It was too close to the margin to do a lobe. That's why he ended up with a pneumonectomy. Well, he's been receiving continuous treatment for his papillomatosis. Um, oh, here's a, here's a laryngoscopy, just if you want to see what these look like, kind of like the other lady, these are smaller, but you see all these little papillomas on the airway surface. And if we go down, you can see more of them like that. So he comes back in, uh, last month for, cause he's having some airway symptoms again. And this was done right after a procedure. So they went in there, uh, at this time he's been managed by, uh, the ENT surgeons cause they do some laser work. And that's the general treatment for these. They'll laser them off to relieve any obstruction. And you can see he's intubated after his procedure. And what had happened is he had developed a pneumothorax. So we did this. They were wondering about what was going on. And he has this huge pneumothorax here. And it's actually a hemopneumothorax. We see some blood down here in the pleural space. And you can see these adhesions, which tells me he's had previous pneumothoraces, multiple adhesions. Uh, so presumably... One of these guys ruptured maybe during uh, ventilation or something like that, and it can cause a pneumothorax. But what was kind of a surprise and unexpected was this mediastinal hematoma right here. And you see there's some irregularity to the posterior lumen, but there's esophagus. We don't really see much else. So uh, he was stable, and so they decided to, rather than do anything at the time because he was doing okay, uh, they did finally get a drain in and manage the pneumothorax. Remember, he's had a pneumonectomy, so he only has one lung. Uh, at this point, uh, they had pulled the ET2 back a little bit, and you can see there's a rent right there in the uh, soft tissues right behind the trachea there and some gas in this hematoma. So that's presumably what happened. So I guess when they were lasering this, they, there was a, enough of a thermal injury that it caused a tracheal tear. Uh, and then and why he bled, I don't know, but he ended up bleeding into his lung in this as well. So this is a complication from treatment. But I suspect the pneumothorax resulted not from the tracheal injury, but rather from the positive, any, any ventilation or maneuvers of the airways that caused one of these guys to, to uh, rupture. But this is one of the worst cases of papillomatosis I've seen with the squame. So I've got the whole stack of images in here for you guys. So you can see the evolution of the squamous cell. And of course, any of these other guys could turn into a squame at any point in time. Wow. And... That's it. All right. I, hey, Jeff, I don't know what you guys think. I find papillomatosis cases, obviously they're rare, but I find follow-up them, of them to be very frustrating because I never know when to worry about sarcoma or um, squamous cell transformation, unless they're obviously getting much larger. I, I don't, they're really difficult, and it seems like we just follow them every three, six months. I don't know what the rationale is or what I... What really should worry me other than just rapid transformation. Right. And I think that's what happened with this guy. I mean, this, these are all from the outside, but this is back in 2009. And, you know, I showed you that little guy in 2000. Let me show you the 2005 um, CT. You know, you've got a thick wall one. You should, you see my screen, right? 
No, not to get. No. <clears throat> ah, let's try that. So back to 2005. So here, you these I don't worry about, mostly when they're cystic or something like that, or even nodular. But something like this, to me, looks... I mean, if you saw this in anybody else, you'd call it a lung cancer. But you're right, because you don't know where they start. But given I have a, another one that's more cystic at this point and a, a little neighbor maybe next to it, this one would give me a little bit of pause. Um, and you could watch it closely. But for whatever reason, I don't know if he was lost to follow up or it was watched for whatever reason. That guy got got angry and um, ended up getting a big, big cancer. This thing here. And then eventually it got even bigger and ended up with a pneumonectomy. So I think he may have been lost to file at that point because it, it, that was a big change but yeah i don't know if they're growing fast become more solid i think that's when you have to pull the trigger um you know pet may or may not have a role because i think the papillomas aren't particularly fdg avid so that potentially could help but if it's a slowly growing one then it's not so you know i just put a needle in it All right. Well, who would like to go next? I have two pieces I can show, Jeff. All right, David. So, <clears throat> can people see uh, four images here? We do. Okay, so uh, let's start back here with a plain film in 2006 on this woman who was uh, premature uh, at the time of her birth. And was on oxygen. I think she was in. She was hospitalized for about six weeks until she was released from the hospital. And then she had RSV infections. Had a lot of childhood infections afterward. So she has, at the time of this chest radiograph, roughly back in the in the early 2000s, she had this CT scan, which shows all of these cystic lesions and air trappy lobules here with preservation of central lobular uh, vessels and so forth and scarring throughout the lungs. So emphysema, cysts, and air trapping throughout the lungs here, and pulmonary hypertension. And you can see her main pulmonary artery is large compared to her aorta. And then this brings it more up to date. Here's a recent chest radiograph this month. This is done AP, so the increase in heart size is hardly artifact, but there's a real increase as well. Definite uh, enlargement of main pulmonary artery here. And you can see that on her current her most recent CT from about a year ago, she has a lot more pulmonary hypertension, a lot more dilation of her pulmonary artery than she did back uh, 10 years before or 11 years before. And the lung stuff is uh, is not that different. It's still a combination of cysts, air trapping, maybe emphysema, depending on what you want to call it. So this is bronchopulmonary dysplasia uh, in an adult. She's now 26 years old. So uh, it has bad consequences. She is a lung transplant candidate. She also has this chest wall deformity. Some of this is from her cardiomegaly, pushing her sternum forward. She has scoliosis. I don't know whether she had much of a sternal deformity originally. So bronchopulmonary dysplasia in an adult. I think I'd seen one previous case of this. Have you guys encountered this before? Just a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Yours is more dramatic with more diffuse disease. The ones I've seen have some peripheral cystic stuff, sort of reminiscent of paraseptal emphysema, but more disorganized. I think we've seen more uh, bronchiolitis, a couple with like a bronchiolitis obliterans type pattern. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, I was just going to say, this seems like a topic that would be ripe for uh, writing an article since a lot of these patients are now reaching adulthood, but it looks like David's a step ahead of us here. Well, this, um, this is a 25-year-old woman. This was AJR report from 2000 uh, from Stanford and from Nestor, showing pretty similar findings here. I think our findings are maybe a little more dramatic in terms of the distension of some of the lobules, but the same, same basic idea here. So bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Um, let me pull up my other case here. This is a young man, a 20-year-old, um, who has this chest radiograph. I've got too many images displayed here, don't I? We call this creative destruction. Okay, 
and you can see that he um, also has enlargement of his main pulmonary artery and his proximal left pulmonary artery, suggesting some pulmonary hypertension. He's very short of breath, and uh, his lateral view is fairly unremarkable. And uh, let me show you a CT scan from the time of his, roughly the time of his presentation. So here is um, a CT scan that shows pretty dramatic pulmonary artery dilation here, suggesting pulmonary hypertension. And the thought was around this time that he had some, he had some, some small pulmonary emboli. Um, but that his degree of pulmonary hypertension is really out of proportion to that. So check out his pulmonary veins at this point. Um, he does have a lot of tissue in his mediastinum that looks like sort of ill-defined amorphous lymphadenopathy. There's a lot of tissue around his, in his hyla too, around his pulmonary vessels. Look at the caliber of his inferior pulmonary vein at this time. This is back in 2015. But you can see that these pulmonary veins are kind of enlarged here in the, in the lower lobes. And look, look at this right pulmonary vein. Its caliber is not that bad. Um, let me bring this up to date now with a more recent CT. We've got on this fellow a CT scan from, I've reverted to the other guy here. Sorry to uh, fumble like this. Okay. So here's his current CT scan from, from this month. And now look at his pulmonary veins again. So his pulmonary veins are grossly narrowed here and they basically don't make it out into the lung. So he's got this pinching off of pulmonary veins on both sides here. And again he has all of this extra tissue in his mediastinum and hyla here. So this looks like some sort of mediastinal fibrosis, fibrosing mediastinitis in this man who's never been in the Midwest as far as we can tell, that is pinching off pulmonary veins and is probably the cause of his dramatic pulmonary hypertension. So, um, you know, never having seen anything like this before, um, he's, he has some interesting history. Uh, in 2014 or 2015, he had very localized Hodgkin's disease that was just in a right axillary lymph node. And that was resected. There was no indication that he had tumor elsewhere. He was not irradiated and he was not given any chemotherapy. It was presumed that they, it was very localized disease. So we can't blame this on chemotherapy or radiation, this mediastinal process. He's not been in histo country. Um, he subsequently had a PET scan that identified a hot inguinal node, and that was biopsied, and they found granulomas in it, non-caseating granulomas. They did not find any tumor in it. So all of this uh, raises the question of, could this be a sarcoid-related uh, fibrosing mediastinitis, which uh, does occur? And I pulled up this article from 2010, and I want you to note this picture here. The CT findings are very similar. Here is a wispy pulmonary vein, inferior pulmonary vein here, which is pretty much pinched off. This was the maximum caliber of this vein here, and there's this extra tissue, this nodal, this amorphous tissue in the mediastinum. So this was a case of granulomatous fibrosing mediastinitis attributed to sarcoidosis in this publication. And the findings are remarkably similar to our case. And our man does have non-casing granulomas on an inguinal node biopsy. So there's some hesitation about biopsying his mediastinum because he's on anticoagulants and you know his condition is, uh, is fragile. But I believe this is probably, again, a sarcoid mediastinal fibrosis or, or fibrosing mediastinitis that is selectively pinching off pulmonary veins. So I was hoping you guys had seen cases like this and could help me out with this because um, we don't know for sure what the diagnosis is. We've, we've had a couple of cases of uh, this uh, due to sarcoidosis. Of fibrosing mediastinitis? Yes. yes. Did it affect uh, pulmonary veins like this or more more the usual district? Uh, no, we, yeah, it actually um, did affect the pulmonary veins and narrow them. Wow. Okay. Now, David, I think I've seen this case or two before, I'm trying to stretch my memory, but it seems very familiar. I don't remember about pulmonary veins, 
but I know that can occur. So I think overall, this phenomenon, I think I may have seen it once or twice. Okay. Maybe now, another or twice. And, and yeah, David, the, the cases we saw at Emory when I was still there, we, um, they affected the veins, but they also would affect the arteries and even the airways to some degree. And there was always the question of whether or not it was histo, but they had thorough workups that they attributed everything to sarcoid. Uh huh. And okay. sometimes, it, sometimes if you do a PET scanning these patients, not only will those areas light up, but often they have extensive disease and the bone marrow lights up because of all the granulomas. So the disease is very extensive and widespread. Mm -hmm. So okay. David, the uh, cases we see with hit in histo country look very different where you get usually a dominant fi dense fibrotic mass. It often is calcified and it kind of sucks everything into it. So yeah. the veins are the first to go because they're the lowest pressure, then the arteries and then the airway. Interesting, your guy, you can see nice bronchial arteries running right through that lymphoid tissue. Right. Which yeah. is another th interesting thing, but I like it for sarcoid. I think I've seen a case, or maybe I don't, I just vaguely, I know it's in the differential for fibrosing mediastinitis, but it's a very different appearance than the traditional histo one where you get this big matted mass. I think I've shown some cases and it pinches off things rather than sort of gradually narrows them. And it's usually... Got it. It's usually unilateral. Well, Brent, is there any chance that you could um, could find some of these cases and show us? Yes, yeah. really, yeah, so I'll pull the cases and I'll uh, bring them next time. Okay, super. Excellent, Dave. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, who's, Brent, you have an echo, so you may want to try to reconnect your audio at some point. Uh, Travis or Howard, you want to go? I can show a case, uh, some cases. All right. Okay, let me show you first. Um, this one just because it's a really nice example of it. So let me bring up the chest radiograph. So this was a person that I saw from the ER. And I think that you know those of us that have been around a while and have certain pattern recognition in the brain will recognize this pattern where <clears throat> The findings are those of reticulation. Some people will call it reticular nodular, but you perceive it more in the upper lung zones. And then when I see that, I really try to zoom in and try to discern whether there's some cystic spaces there. And of course, sometimes you can be quite sure that there are, and sometimes you're not quite sure, but there may be some cystic spaces there and of course, I don't know how it projects for you guys over the uh, connection. But when I see that, and what I did was I called up and I said, does the person smoke? Because you know what I had in mind, and you may have seen the diagnosis already. But then sure enough, there's a great correlation. So I already had something in mind, and when I saw this, I said, yep, got it. So there's really no differential. This is so typical for PLCH. So it's the appearance of the reticulation, the distribution of it, and then sometimes, if you're lucky, you might be able to perceive the cystic spaces. These are not particularly large, but otherwise a really nice example of a PLCH and next case kind of thing, just absolutely typical of that. It's a really nice teaching case of PLCH. I don't have a, a, di a pathology, of course, but um, at least I'm, I have no doubt that that's what it is because it's so typical. All right, this one over here is interesting because I've shown cases like this before, and here is a nice example of it, and we haven't seen it too often, but let me show you this. So let me go to make this a coronal. So the history is a little bit convoluted here, but I'll just show you what I saw. So before we've talked about the notion of what has been described at least in one case report in relation to interlobular septa as lymphatic pearls. And we've talked before about maybe a nicer description for it being septal lakes. So here is a really nice example of certainly up here in the left upper lobe as I scroll back and forth of septal lakes. So when these things get that round, 
kind of easy to describe to see why we would describe them as septal lakes. So of course there's interstitial edema, but in a couple of places like that up here we have a really nice example of septal lakes or what are called lymphatic pearls. So I was pretty sure this person had lung edema. She's been worked out for a number of things including pulmonary hypotension. I'm not quite sure why, but this follow-up which is many months later just shows you of course that that was all reversible and she doesn't have any lung edema at this time. So a really nice example of that. I've got a bunch of cases now and I'm, I'm thinking of maybe if anyone wants someone to write that up as a descriptive thing, I think I've got maybe four of them with follow-up um, of septal lakes. Yeah, since you brought it up, Howard, I've seen a couple of cases as well. I, I look much harder for that now with edema. Uh, yeah. That's another nice example. Okay, this one goes for you guys that, um, I know Travis has mentioned this before and I know David has too, but in the context of plural disease, seeing a situation where, and let me just pick up a nice example of it here maybe, of this phenomenon, one of these doesn't go all the way down, so let me pick up another one that shows this maybe here of hypertrophy of fat, subpleural fat in a patient with pleural disease. So here, particularly in the basal chest here, is a really nice example of that phenomenon. So this is a person that's diabetic. The person came here from elsewhere with a diagnosis of pneumonia and pleural fluid. And as you can see, the chest tube was placed a catheter to drain some of the pleural fluid from the left side and this is a really nice example. So my understanding of anatomy is that of course here is visceral pleural surface and here we have a lot of fat but there's a lot of opacity on this side of it as well. So I'm not quite sure what the pathology is there exactly but this has been described as, well that's the anatomy. So the question I have for you guys is um, what is exactly thickened? So of course we have the visceral pleura, then we have parietal pleura, then we have the subpleural fat, and then we have endothoracic fascia. And then here is a description of prominent subpleural fat with chronic pleural disease, and the intimation is that it's benign. And here I'm going to ask David because he has an article that David was involved with about the appearance of extra pleural fat in empyema. So David, uh, particularly down here, external to that fat, way down here, where I'm pointing here, what is right. exactly this? It's just edema of all the, the tissues outside of the, outside of even the subpleural fat. Yeah, it's probably edema, you know, mixed in with muscle and stuff like that. But so once you identified the fat, anything internal to that is the visceral and the parietal pleura. So the fat layer tells us that we're already in chest wall. We're outside the parietal yeah. pleura. Yeah. So this this yeah. is uh, this is either edema in that fat or in the muscle that's nearby, or just in the uh, the fibrous tissue of the chest wall. Since there's not muscle on the inner surface of the rib, you know, the, the muscles sort of attach to the bottom and the, the edges of the rib, but not through the center. It's probably just um, fibrous tissue that's edematous. So it's obviously going to be outside of this first fat layer, and then there's... Right. And it's not, probably, not, probably not muscle. Uh, you, you know, normally you don't find muscle between lung and the body of the rib. So it's probably uh, fascial tissue of uh, yeah. chest wall that's swollen. Maybe I've not noticed it before, but this is a particular nice example of a lot of edema, right. presumably in that outside of the. And the, the fat, the fat the, is infiltrated with edema too, so the fat is yeah, not. Yeah, it's over a little bit here, right? You have these little streaks of stuff right. going through the fat. It's edematous, particularly over there, right? Soggy. So, yeah. Nice example. So, yeah, it's just a nice example of that phenomenon. Exactly why it happens, I don't know why the fat gets that apparently that thick. Mm -hmm. But it's just chronic just chronic effusions and chronic inflammation, right? That causes it to hypertrophy or, or you know? I think increase in the 
body trying to wall it off. You know, just trying to, because there's chronic inflammation. I use, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, I use that finding a lot. Like if you have a cavity or something in the lungs, if the extrapleural fat is thick and it's been there for some time versus it's an acute, ne acute necrotizing infection versus like, you know, a TB or sarcoid cavity usually has that thick rind of fat yeah. around it. Yeah. I'm not sure how long this person has had it because I don't have previous radiographs to compare with. I just have what I showed you. So I thought that was really kind of interesting and I'm curious. David, I'm just curious what your your connection to Sherry Tithi is. I saw both of you as art, authors on that article. Before she uh, before she went to St. Louis, she was at the VA here in Seattle for many years, and then her move was to uh, to your former group. So she was in Seattle when I arrived here in '86, and I think she moved in the early '90s. Very cool. I didn't know that. Okay. This again is um, not that super unusual, but a really nice example of it. So a previously healthy person with consolidation in the right upper lobe. And this I think I'm going to put in my teaching of signs and radiology is a nice example of the bulging fissure. So here on the lateral projection in relation to this portion of the major fissure, a nice example of a bulging fissure. And then of course, not unexpectedly, if you look in there, you begin to see areas of cavitation, so a necrotizing pneumonia in there. This just thick slab will just go along with showing and teaching about the, the bulging fissure. So there's the bulge right back here, and there's the areas of cavitation within. So no organism was recovered. You know, it's been treated with antibiotics, and we know that certainly happens, but certainly very consistent. Necrotizing pneumonia bulging fissure sign, really nice example. And then just the last one, it's just a device thing. So this person came in uh, resuscitation in the field and we see the defibrillator, we see the endotracheal tube. This thing over here is part of a device or at least the opaque portion of a device which if you look in Google for something like CPR meter or some names like that, there is a device you can put on the chest, and that's the device you put your hands on when you do CPR, and it measures the frequency and the, the depth of your CPR, the efficacy of your pushing, and I guess it says push harder or push more frequently. But this is just part of a monitoring device associated with that device that some people ostensibly use when they do CPR. So if I'm wrong about that, tell me, tell me I'm wrong. Is it on the surface of the person or is it inside? On the surface. It's just a pad. It's about uh, like four inches by four inches and you actually put your hands on it, right? Where you do CPR. And shouldn't, you it, pull... shouldn't it be lower though? Don't you want it centered over the body, the heart? Uh, you would think so, but that's where it was in this person, so I don't know. Okay. So it should play music for you. You know, you're, you're supposed to time yourself with that, um, that um, disco song, Staying Alive. No, that's supposed to give you the proper timing for 100, 100 strokes a minute. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, I've got some others, but I will say them for another time, Jeff. Okay, thanks, Howard. I'm glad you said that. I've never known what that thing is. Is it part of the defibrillator pads, too, or is it a separate? Completely separate optional thing. I don't know how much they charge for it. I'm sure the seller likes to sell it to everyone that will buy it. and. Well, when I looked at it on Google just now, it's kind of a, it's it's a, just a separate thing. It almost looks like a like a like an iPod Nano or, or Mini or whatever you'd stick on the chest. It has a little wire that goes to the I guess the readout thing. But there's a variety of them. Yep, little pads, little things. Probably a, a phone app for it too now too. Use yep. the uh, the gyroscope and all that. If not, someone there's a there's your potential uh, retirement ticket. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Travis or Brett? I've got a few. All right. Hey, Travis, did you find out if that um, consult you sent was on heart or not? They're not. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Give me one second. Okay. I'm showing my screen. You should see it now. Yep. Would you? 
All right, the, um, this first one I'm going to show, not this one. Let's go, I want to show this one. This one's got a little bit for everyone. I'm going to start with the radiograph, and this is, this part is, is mostly for Howard. It's for everyone, though, just because he showed a case a few months ago that had an interesting finding in this region. And I, you may have already seen it on the PA view, but I want to start with the lateral view, because I know you had a case talking about this area. And here we see the posterior wall of the inferior vena cava, and then you notice that there's this more abnormal convexity right here. And when you look on the PA view, that you see right here that there's a correlate right at the right anterior, or kind of anterior cardiophrenic angle there, but right along the IVC. So it's a Ooh. cute little finding on the radiograph. Yeah. And I have, I have no idea. I'm, I'm guessing this wasn't detected at the time on the outside radiograph because it was reported as being incidentally discovered on this calcium score CT. So this guy's in his 40s, underwent a calcium score CT because of family history of, of early coronary artery disease. And you see this circumscribed mass right here, paracaval, and it measures anywhere between 15 and 20 Hounsfield units. They're a little noisy here. And I'm going to preface this by saying we still don't know what this is, and I'll tell you what my gut was, and I kind of hedged away from my gut, and now I'm going back to what I initially was thinking. You can see there's some heterogeneous enhancement here on CT. It looks like it's separate from the liver. It kind of you get a little bit of volume averaging, I think, with the liver, but it definitely looks separate. So I'm curious what you guys think. I'll show you the MR, and then tell you what I'm thinking. I don't want to bias anybody. A portion. They're a little vessel, as in. Okay. As in uh, no. Right here, I don't know if it's. I'll just go to the more recent CT because it hasn't changed in a year. Can you show us the long window at that level? Sorry, what did you say? A long window? Long window at the level of this lesion. Yeah. Um, and they're vis. Oh, there's some. Are they vessels feeding it from without? Think, yeah, like little guys. I think there are. Yeah, there are a couple little vessels feeding it, and this definitely has some internal enhancement. Yeah. And maybe, I don't even know, maybe that's a little focus of calcification now, or it's just a, more of a little focal collection of, of enhancement there. What I would like this to be is a, uh, is a neurofibroma on the phrenic nerve, because that, no. that would be extremely happy. Well, that's, that's one of the things that's in the differential. Um, it wasn't the first thing I thought of. The first thing that came to my mind was a paraganglioma, and then I, and but the first thing that came to the surgeon's mind and the first thing that came to the radiologist's mind at the outside hospital who read this MR was a nerve sheath tumor or some sort of Schwann And I don't know, without doing some more imaging like an MIBG, we're going to be able to figure it out. You can see it's T2 hyperintense, has a little bit of that you know, salt and pepper look to it, and it does pretty avidly enhance after contrast, I'll show you. And it hasn't changed in a year. He's asymptomatic. He did not... He didn't undergo the, the calcium score because of hypertension. Um, I've, talked to, I've talked to others. Sanjeev said he's seen one case of a, of a paraganglioma in a similar location when he was at a conference in South America. So he doesn't have the images, but I don't know. I couldn't find any reports of a, of a schwannoma right here, but mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody wants to vote one way or the other, because I start... My first thought was maybe a weird paraganglioma, but then I was thinking more nerve sheath tumor based on the MR, but now I'm kind of leaning back towards paraganglioma. So you said he's got hypertension and he's 40. He, oh, he does not, no, I said, he, sorry, he does not have hypertension. Oh, not have, okay. The intensity of enhancement is not super intense on the contrast uh, CT. No. Particularly, um, which would really push one towards a paraganglioma if it was really bright or brighter yeah. day. So, but it could be. And not a, not a typical location, Travis, for a paraganglioma. They can occur in funny places, but not usually there. Agreed. Yes. Yeah. Certainly not really a typical location for a nerve sheath tumor either, but no, 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 I don't know. So I was wondering if anybody's seen anything. Anywhere else where the adrenal's okay? Yeah. Yeah, no, no history of a MEN syndrome or, or anything else. So, I don't know. Maybe, um, 
maybe we should never find out. Just leave it alone. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> and then and then David can can show it as a nerve sheet tumor, and I can show it as a paraganglioma. Yeah. Yeah. Choose your <laughs> choose your own adventure. Yeah. So. All right, well, I just thought, I thought it was a really cute radiograph and an interesting case, and maybe we'll find out. All right, this one is a really quite a dramatic CT that I saw yesterday at the VA. Now, this guy, well, I actually saw a radiograph yesterday, and then I went back and looked at his CT. This guy's 90 or 91 now, and look at his spine. That's where the finding is. And you'll see that over several levels, he really has no cortex posteriorly. And it's several contiguous levels. And I was, you know, instantly was like, wow, what kind of cancer could this guy have that's destroying his spine? I uh, looked at it, I'll show you in, in sagittal, and you can see that's quite a dramatic appearance of his spine at multiple contiguous levels. And then you start to notice. Wait. Sorry, were you going to say something, Howard? No, I'm just gasping oh. over. <laughs> yeah, so the um yeah, so then you start to wonder, well, maybe it's just a little bit of you know, there's cortical thickening, it's certainly not really destroyed. And you can see at these levels he's got some cortical thickening, but he actually has a known diagnosis for quite a long time, and I'm gonna show you his pelvis. And this is as you can see, this is from eleven years ago, and he's got very characteristic appearance of Paget's disease. And you can see he's got thickening of all his, you know, the whatever the ilioischial and iliopectinate lines. You can see it's involving his right femur. He even has a little bit of bowing. I don't know if there's a, a fracture or partially fractured here. Um, but this is mostly the the blastic phase, but some of it may be mixed. And uh, his spine has looked like that for quite some time too. He had a an old MR just showing that his spine has had involvement of contiguous levels for a long time. And I've got a bunch of different images too, but his bone scan, I mean, look, it's pretty impressive, this, yeah. this amount of involvement in his skull. I don't have skull radiographs in fact, but this is the most dramatic case of, of polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, or sorry, of Paget's disease that I've seen in, a, um, in an adult involved in the spine. But I thought this was really, really quite an interesting case. And then I've got the um, there's a nice, it's an older article from, from Radiographics just talking about Paget's disease. I didn't realize that polyostotic disease is more common than monostotic disease. And so, of course, the typical findings when you get to more of the blastic phase or the mixed lytic and blastic phases, you start getting thickening of the trabecula. I guess this is more of the lytic phase. But then there's some very characteristic here. You see, just like this guy, the thickening of the cortical bone, these coarse trabeculations. And, Kind of a cool half picture too. He doesn't really have this this picture frame look of his vertebral bodies, but this has been going on for a while. So I don't know. Really, really cool Travis, case. Travis, is that degree of destruction of the vertebral bodies typical? Because I'm used to seeing the sclerotic stuff, not not the lytic stuff that you showed. I don't I don't know, and um, that's that's a question I haven't had a chance to ask the bone guys yet, and. I'd be curious what any of your bone guys have to say, because it, it's not even, yeah, I don't even know how much of it is, is really destruction or, or replacement. I mean, he doesn't, it's been like that for 10 years, and he doesn't have any pathologic fractures, so clearly there's some support to it. I have no idea. Okay. I mean, that's why it's just so dramatic. That was not the first thing I thought of when I you know, saw that yesterday on the spine. I was thinking that he had some sort of you know, lytic metastatic disease, but I don't know. Have you guys noticed, uh, I mean, I haven't seen a case in years. I think I saw a couple as a resident. I mean, Dave and Howard, you've been practicing longer. Have you noticed uh, the frequency of Paget's disease has gone way down? I think so. Because I don't know. We learned about it as a resident, and we saw a couple cases. It was in all, you know, articles, books, but you just don't see it anymore. I mean, with as many chests as we read, we should see it more. Yeah. I, I, I see the occasional thickened rib. It looks like Paget's disease, but yeah, nothing more than one. That's why I was so surprised that it's more, they're saying polyostotic is more common than monostotic, because if I see it, usually it's only in one rib. Right. Yeah. Uh, the clavicle, I guess, is the most frequent thing I see with it. But uh, I don't even know the mechanism. Is there? Is it a marrow problem, or what is it that's that's uh, 
causing these bones to remodel? It's an osteoblast and osteoclast thing, and I don't know. I I, I have to. I didn't have enough time to look through this, but um, it does. It's like an imbalance of the and and it kind of talks about it here. I think early on in at the, some point, I thought there was a theory that maybe it was induced by a virus, and maybe that's why the incidence has dropped. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Don't know. Uh, if I if I have time, I'll show it to one of our bone guys, or when I have time, I will. All right. I want to show one more. This is just kind of a. a it's it's kind of a silly case, I think, um, because. This is a patient who, she's young, she's 20, she's 25, and she had chest pain. She underwent the, now I'm going to preface this by saying this did not happen at our institution and would not happen at our institution, I don't think. But she had a coronary CTA, and this was done elsewhere. And for those of us that do coronary CTA, we see this all the time. She has a little segment of bridging, typical in the mid-LAD distribution, it dives into the myocardium. And yeah, there's a little bit of motion here in it. You know, the vessel, whatever, looks like it tapers a little. And there's a nice curved NPR just showing what myocardial bridging looks like. And this is something we see all the time on, on CT. And they never used to see it on cath because you wouldn't see this degree of anatomic detail with the little myocardium here. But anyway, she was having chest pain. You can see she has a, li she has a little bit of a pectus. I'm not even convinced it's as much of a pectus as it is a, um, a straight back syndrome. But anyway, to make a long story short, at another institution, she underwent a pectus repair, and they did an unroofing of this short segment of bridging at the time. She underwent a cath, and they thought maybe she had some, some alteration of her flow. To make a long story short, she then got a follow-up study here uh, just last week. You can see I'm not even sure what they did to her sternum, but um, she's just got a clip around her LAD, and it's not quite as deep in the myocardium now. But needless to say that her um, her symptoms didn't change after her surgery, that it didn't improve her chest pain, because I've never seen a case that I actually could attribute bridging to be a cause of chest pain. We do report it, and I think it's, you know, I think we always just mention it in the report. I don't know, Brent, is, I don't know if you're there with Art or anyone else. I'm, or, I'm here by myself, but uh, okay. it's, uh, that, that's, I mean, it's so common that I, yeah. I don't, you know, I mean, we never uh, see any resections of, I mean, any, you know, corrections, so-called corrections of bridging around here. I mean, unless yeah. it's very, very deep, you know. Yeah, but, yeah, I don't know if anybody else, if you guys are, if any of your coronary colleagues are there or if you're doing this, because I think it's important just to mention, but I think it's more just a normal anatomic variant. We always see this little bit of bridging, so, or frequently. I think it's been reported as high as a third of patients. So, I just thought it was interesting. Yeah, and, of course, it didn't. Go back yeah. to her left atrium on the axial. Go back to her left atrium? Yeah, I thought I saw a membrane or something there. Maybe it's just been an edge, but if you went down, right? right. Is, that just, is that just a... You know, that's been described. So Sean Teague, there was like, I think he was one of the ones involved with it. They, they called this like a little atrial septal pouch. Uh -huh. And it doesn't exactly mean that there's a PFO there. And I don't know exactly what it is. We see this... Not infrequently. Too. I wonder if it's like a remnant of the frame and ovale. It's just yeah, not if like it's not open, but it's just a little area where you know. yeah. Okay, I was just curious. I saw that come by. Yeah, no, I just saw it. I saw it in one poster one time. I think they called this an atrial septal pouch. Okay, and and I wouldn't be surprised if the patient had elevated right heart pressures, if a you know if a PFO would pop open there or something. Yeah, because yeah, it kind of looks like that. It's just bigger, but I'm sure it's a, a some sort of embryologic remnant from the fusion of the septum primum and septum secundum, so. Okay. I'm happy to see no one put a patch there because they did all the other things. I'm glad they didn't see that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> all right, Pretty good night, right. guys. Yeah. Top of the hour here, so thank you, and we will talk again next week. All right, great, guys. Take care. Thank you.